Before we begin, I'm not very comfortable in the debate genre, so please don't expect too many videos like this from me. Also, don't expect too many videos from me at all, because making videos is really hard. Sony, Activision, and Take-Two have all decided to use the transition into a new console generation as a smokescreen to bump the price of their full-price AAA titles from $60 to $70. Why? Well, inflation and budgets and, you know, markets and stuff, and sure, it makes sense. Yep, I, I guess they just have to. Oh well. This has had a pretty universally negative reception, but also just a bit too much of an attitude that this was inevitable, and even necessary, and even good. There are countless articles on how more expensive full-price games are good, actually. I have gone through what I feel is a pretty representative slice of these articles, and I've heard their arguments and I've grouped the arguments into several categories. I'm not going to straw man here, these are all specific arguments from real articles. One last thing, disclaimer, this only applies to USD. Whoa, this is worthless. Like most Americans, I think my country is the only one, and my bubble of experience is very narrow. Hope that's okay. We are going to start with by far the most common argument in all of these articles. Hide your Azumanga Daio characters because we're about to talk about inflation. <laughs> Boy, this is a big one. The gist of this argument is, look at the price of movie tickets and gallons of milk. They've gone up since 2005 too, so why shouldn't video games? The price of gallons of milk is generally used as a basic, relatable, baseline example of inflation. What could it cost? Ten dollars? So that's why the comparison gets drawn, but I have more of a problem with the other comparison. 2005 is the year $60 games became standard everywhere when Call of Duty set the new standard, according to pretty much all of these articles, so we'll use that year. In 2005, the average price of a movie ticket in the US was $6.41. Inflation to 2019 would equal about $8.39, but the average price of a ticket in 2019 was $9.16. So fairly above the inflation rate, but in the ballpark. This is all surprising to me because where I live, Movie tickets are like between 10 and 14 bucks, sometimes even more. They fluctuate wildly per region, per theater chain, per movie, per day, per time. How old the person is, whether the person is in the military, whether or not the customer has a rewards card, a person's race, uh, well, mm, okay, maybe, maybe not that one anymore. The price of full price AAA games in the US since 2005 has been 60 bucks universally for everyone. So because one is standardized and one is not, I think they're not fairly comparable. But I also think they're not comparable because they're nothing alike. Seeing a movie in a big theater with an audience is not buying a product. It's an experience. It's a date night. It's an event. It's a memory of the before times. Video games are a product that you purchase to own. And I know, I know video game ownership is getting less and less concrete, but that's beside the point. They're home media. If we're comparing the price of games to the price of movies, we should use home media. So what was the price of a new full price DVD in 2005? Let's see. For the record, the hypothesis is as follows. $70 is about 15% more than $60, so if we're comparing them, prices of home video should be higher today than they were in 2005 by about 15%. This is about half of what is expected of inflation, which is close to 30%. Let's use the cheapest store, Walmart, and let's look at two Wayback Machine dates. So what are we watching, boys? I better go to the past. This is DVD. She's got a big trunk. Say, sure. Go back, go grab it. Come to my undercarriage. Still alive, baby? The track of lacking. Don't touch that squirrel's nuts. No. Let's. So we average together all 13 of these DVDs and we come up with an average of $18.11. Run this through the old Dobson machine and we get $24.14. But we're not using the inflation rate of 33%, we're only going to use 15%. And that gives us about $20.83. Alright, so let's look at 13 Blu-rays from 2020 and see how they compare. They should be $20.83 or more. We're going to use the same website, walmart.com, we're only going to use sold and shipped by walmart.com, and we're only going to use movies that came out in 2020, if there are 13 movies that came out in 2020. There might not be. Alright, let's see. Come on, man! Adrian is dead. Alright! 
challenger? Jumanji. What? Uh, yep, I could only think of nine. All right, let's use some 2019 movies too. Sorry. Because I'm rich. They fly now. I feel like this is a fair group of movies to choose. The average price is 17.45. That's less than the 2005 lot. Isn't data journalism fun? No, this was a miserable thing to try to research. But I personally think that this was a pretty fair comparison. I'm going to draw the conclusion that the price of home video has not gone up since 2005. Even though on paper, better tech, higher film budgets, and inflation dictate that they should have gone up. I know this data is not perfect, and I know it's still kind of not super comparable, but I think it's better than just looking at movie tickets and saying, well, they're doing it. I don't know. That's my take anyway. But you know what I find interesting? Everyone talks about the price of movies, but no one talks about the price of music going up. Do you know why? Because everyone knows the price of music hasn't gone up because the music industry collapsed. We are only just beginning to truly understand the apocalyptic scale of the music industry crash starting in the early 2000s. Even with streaming revenue, it's not even remotely close to what it was. And it happened because people stopped paying for music. But no one argues about home video or music. They mention movie tickets. And yes, I concede. The price of movie tickets did indeed go up from 2005 to 2019. If you really want to compare them, let's just compare them. Six and a half bucks is not a lot to pay for something. And neither is nine bucks. The average price of movie tickets has risen by less than $3 in 15 years. Movie tickets are usually pretty affordable. That's why theaters make all their money in snacks. Even if it's the game of the year, $60 is always a lot to pay for a video game. Gradually creeping the price of movie tickets up by $2.75 over one and a half decades is a far cry from taking a $60 purchase and raising it by 10 bucks overnight. That really stings. Anyway, my closing arguments for this segment are comparing the standardized price of the purchase of a video game to own to the rise in the extremely variable price of a one-night admission to a limited-time entertainment event is dumb, and there's no real reason to compare them. And when comparing video games to the still non-standardized but more similar home video market, there is no rise in price. Not that I could find. So stop talking to me about movie tickets. Moving on. This is all necessary. Well, what's all this useless junk? That's the useless junk for scene uh, 28. This argument is made by basically every single article I could find on the subject. The budgets of games have risen and prices will have to rise to accommodate this. Obviously. Of course, right? The third most expensive game of all time is probably a money laundering scam. Data on game budgets is woefully incomplete, so we just have to rely mostly on what we hear when these executives deign to provide us with this information. Unfortunately, that leaves us with a Wikipedia page full of holes that sources places like The Escapist. Also, these executives lie all the time about everything. I'm not doubting that the budgets of games are extravagant, but it's impossible to get good data on this when Bobby Kotick claims outlandish stuff like Destiny cost $500 million. It didn't. So we're mostly just going to have to rely on rough estimates. Very rough. For example, my sister series, Extra Credits, comes up with this figure for your average AAA video Somewhere game. Somewhere between $75 and $100 million. Oh well. And the frustrating truth of it is that there's just not a lot of space to shave things down. It's based on average costs of game developers, the average number of employees, the average price to rent offices, the price to pay celebrity voice actors. Usually two monitors, a desk chair, maybe some cubicle walls, a mouse and a keyboard and so on. You'll also want to keep the studio kitchen stocked. You're going to need a janitorial service too. I would really like to see a source on this just so I can understand. And luckily, extra credits list their source, right? Um, hmm. Oh, here it is. Trust me. James Portnow, the lead writer on extra credits since the beginning and at the time of this episode, is a professional game designer. See, he was a developer on Call of Duty, so he has the inside scoop. Which Call of Duty? Uh, you know, the Call of Duty series. Huh. Doesn't say the specific game, and I can't find it anywhere. Even in their own mailbag special, they're particularly vague. And James, 
Well, as he would put it, he gallivants. He's not in the credits for Call of Duty 2, or 1, or Finest Hour, or Roads to Victory. Oh, here we go. James Port now handled sound and a variety of other duties in, uh... Call of Duty Devil's Brigade. Oh. And, you know, he also worked at Divide by Zero Games, which developed... Uh, okay, well, he was a narrative consultant on the game most known for its narrative, Farmville. Okay, look, <laughs> I don't doubt James's assertion that game budgets are outrageous. Clearly, they are out of control. Specifics aside, I do agree with his point here. We've entered the era beyond the big budget game. We're now in the era of the giga budget game. But his assertion is also that... There's just not a lot of space to shave things down. All I have to say is... Dynamic. 4K. Horse balls. I'm not working blue. This is a real example. They're dynamic. They react to the weather system, so if you take your horse up in the mountains and it gets chilly, they're gonna... shrivel up. They're gonna get smaller. They're gonna cool. shrink. Question. How many 10 out of 10 reviews would have been dramatically lowered to a 9.8 if they hadn't done this. Did this feature put the game over the top to a 10 for a single reviewer? This is real, this is real news. We're this not making serious. this up. Yeah, no, we're not. They're, they uh, really, they made the horses. And, uh, go check out. Uh, this is an almost satirical, but very real and very egregious example of what game budgets are bloated by. But in my opinion, this isn't even the most egregious example in this game. Late in development, it was decided by higher-ups, presumably, that cinematic black bars were going to be added to Red Dead Redemption 2's cutscenes. Which is not as simple as it sounds, although I'm not sure anyone told them that. You know, you can't just plaster the black bars over the scenes. Every single cutscene's camera had to be reframed and redirected to account for this new aspect ratio to avoid framing issues. So, that's a lot of work that now has to be done because of black bars, so they crunched the problem. I refer to them as Rockstar's Crunch Bars. So they inflated the budget to go through and redirect every single completed cutscene to add cinematic black bars that modders removed the same day it came to PC! It was the same day! Was that worth it? Is that not something that could have been shaved down? Oh well. Features that nobody wants happen all the time, but that's just what we can see. There is no telling what kind of money gets wasted behind the scenes on stuff like this. We got a brief glimpse into a particular disaster, Anthem. A ton of money was wasted during the development of Anthem, but my favorite example is how they went back and forth adding and removing and re-adding and re-removing flying for years, and they finally put it back in to impress one executive, Patrick Soderlund, who saw it and literally said, that was fucking awesome. The answer, in my uneducated opinion, literally, to sustaining gigabudget games is not charging more for them. I think the answer is gigabudget games aren't sustainable. I know. Oh well. Maybe games should simply cost less. Don't tell me they can't, I know they can. Even if you have to cut Bobby's multi-million dollar bonuses, or Dennis Durkin's, or maybe don't pay streamers $50,000 an hour just to play your game for a couple days. Does that sound sustainable? Or maybe stop fixing all of your problems with crunch. I know it happens to every huge project in every industry with a deadline. But do everything you can to minimize it. Like maybe run a pros and cons exercise on those cinematic black bars you wanted. It's just like the movies! And probably most importantly, stop letting clueless bonehead executives manage your game development company into the ground. Games do have a budget problem, clearly. But why on earth should we pay for that? And why does every single article I found on the subject insist that we should? Final arguments on budgets. The problem with gigabudget games isn't that they're being sold for too little, it's that they simply cost too much. Don't tell me you can't cut corners when it's blatantly obvious to everyone which superfluous spending could be cut. And finally, manage your projects better. You, just, you have to do it. You can't just not do it. If you don't manage your projects well and the game budget gets out of control, you lose money. Sorry. And besides, don't they already make up for big budgets with microtransactions? No, it won't. Do I even have to explain? Okay, well, this is going to be short. So the argument is, 
if we raise the price of games, then AAA publishers won't have to fill their games with loot boxes and microtransactions. Make no mistake, those really are our only two options right now. Because, like I said at the beginning, AAA games just should not cost $60 anymore. Alright, so let's look at the games that have been known to use a lot of microtransactions while still launching for full price. So that mainly leaves us with yearly shooters like Call of Duty and sports games like NBA 2K. Alright, let's look at the latter first. This year's entry, NBA 2K21, is basically identical to NBA 2K20. And NBA 2K20 was so identical to the previous game, NBA 2K19, that they literally forgot to change the taskbar icon. FIFA 21 is so identical to FIFA 20 that IGN copy and pasted their review for FIFA 20 in protest. A review, by the way, which mostly talked about how FIFA 20 is identical to FIFA 19. Do these games even have budgets? They just copy and paste it! That goes for other sports games too. Madden in particular got ripped to shreds this year. I don't play sports games <laughs> because I like video games. Uh, so I don't know how different these games are usually from year to year, but the reviews I've seen talk about minor tweaks at best. From the crowd, which finally has kids in it. How expensive can these full price games be that they simply have to offset the costs with some of the worst examples of microtransactions and loot boxes in the entire business. Yes! All right, well, what about the monetization of slightly more real games like shooters, say Activision's Call of Duty Black Ops 4 from 2018? I mentioned in a previous video that they had basically the worst loot boxes I've ever seen. Two bucks a pop, three items each, no visible probabilities, the potential to roll duplicates, and no way to earn the full-size crates through gameplay, you can only buy them, and they contain pay-to-win experience-enhancing guns! These games must have bigger budgets than sports games, and Call of Duty in particular is known for having some of the biggest budgets ever. And microtransactions have a terrible reputation for being unethical and anti-consumer. So if these games could charge $70, which is happening, why wouldn't they want to take this opportunity to drop the baggage of unethical monetization? Because AAA publishers do not think they're bad. We think that. They do not. I know that they don't because they tell us! A randomized content mechanic, a surprise mechanic, a loot box. Um, I, I have no qualms that they are implemented in an unethical way. They have no reason to want to stop doing this because they genuinely think they're doing nothing wrong. To refer back to Extra Credit's metaphor of a forked road... Make no mistake, those really are our only two options right now. It's not going to be this road or this road. It's going to be both! Demon Souls, $70, comes with pre-order bonuses and a $20 DLC pack full of in-game items. Call of Duty Cold War $70 will have battle passes as usual, and NBA 2K21 $70 obviously has loot boxes and microtransactions, surprising no one. This argument has already been proven wrong. I'm not saying these are bad. Okay, these are bad. I'm just saying this argument is wrong. It might have come from a place of optimism, but it was really just kind of delusional. Closing arguments. The full price games that use the worst microtransactions are sports games that can't possibly have big budgets. There is no incentive for game companies to drop loot boxes when game prices go up because they truly view them as ethical and they're not looking for a way out. And a lot of games with higher prices already have microtransactions confirmed. But hey, it was a nice thought. Did you know NBA 2K21 has unskippable ads? It may seem like a lot of work, but trust me, it's all worth it once the project is complete. In fact, we're gonna let one lucky gamer try our game early. Tell us what you think. Uh, load times are a little long. I don't really like it. Five out of ten. kind of hilarious how long it took me to find anyone arguing that the reason games should be more expensive is that they're just better now. And this is so obviously not true that the only person I could find who dared to make this argument is the CEO of Take-Two Interactive, Strauss Zelnick, said in an interview with GamesIndustry.biz that the price is justified when you're delivering extraordinary quality. And that's what our company prides itself on doing. 
Okay, the man is standing behind his products. Good for him. Let's see if he's right. Let's take a look at Take-Two Interactive's most recent games, and let's organize them by subsidiary. Rockstar. Red Dead Redemption 2. Okay, pretty solid. A lot of people had a problem with that game's core gameplay, but, you know, you could make the case with this one, sure. What else has Rockstar done since 2013? Oh. Irrational Games is dead, apparently, and it's now Ghost Story Games? This apparently happened years ago, and I totally did not even notice. Well, has Ghost Story Games made anything? Oh. Social Point. They make mobile games, and that doesn't count. Private Division. Okay, Kerbal Space Program is pretty good, and the sequel's coming out to... What? The Outer Worlds got a Game of the Year nomination, but it definitely didn't stick around in relevance. Personally, I dropped it after a few Look hours. But people like it, I guess. Came out of nowhere, Do they? Ancestors was completely forgotten about, and I have... Never heard of this game before, but sure, Private Division is okay, I guess, but definitely not earth-shattering amazing games. And that just leaves the big one. 2K. And 2K is... kind of the worst? Okay, so take two interactive aside, let's look at the other $70 launch titles and see if they're worth it. Call of Duty is Call of Duty. Cold War at least looks interesting, although I admit I have seen no gameplay, and all I've seen is Ronald Reagan. Demon Souls is a remake by Bluepoint, and remakes are what they do best. I heard the Shadow of the Colossus remake was pretty great. This game, however, turned me away with its insane DLC, which is already proving to be pretty controversial. I can't even remotely pretend to be interested in Godfall at all. In the last PS5 event, they spent forever talking about this game. Maybe this looks good to someone out there, but I can't get into this. For some reason, NBA 2K21 is only $70 on the next-gen ports and is $60 right now, and by all accounts, it's the most hated game of the year. Miles Morales is 50, Valhalla is 60, Bug Snacks better not be $70, so that just leaves... <laughs> Destruction All-Stars. <laughs> okay, while I was making this video, this game got wisely delayed to February and included in PS Plus for free. This is a smart move because, oh my god, this game was so doomed before. Can you imagine paying $70 for this? These are the games leading the $70 revolution. And, uh, I'm sorry, Strauss. They're not making the best case for it. That was the shortest entry. Uh, closing thoughts? No. And finally, the last argument. No argument. Games market analyst Matt Piscatella says that the price is just a premium that you pay if you want to play games on day one. And I'm not sure why we let game analysts say anything to anyone, but there you go. Forbes says that any potential losses will be less than the money they make up with the higher price. And if enough publishers pull it off, the rest could follow. And no techie, whoever they are, in the most disjointed and angry article that I found said, So fucking what? Stop hand-wringing. It's worth it. It's just ten dollars. Pay it. You pay for Quibi, so you have no right to complain. I am Carly, your passenger. If you're not going to make an argument, I'm not going to. This is inevitable. We just have to accept it. No, it's not. And no, we don't. There. That was easy. Everything that guy just says bullshit. Thank you. But in a way, these are kind of the most right arguments. It's happening. My argument has already lost. There really isn't a solid reason to raise the price. It's just... They're going to raise the price because they can. Or can they? As of now, there's only a few companies trying this, and the consoles they're trying it on are hard to get, expensive, and kind of hideous? And in my opinion, it's never been easier to wait for the slim models because good lord, not a lot of people are gonna have these for a while. So in this very limited market, it would take a very strong push all at once to get this new, unpopular concrete to set. 
And then Destruction All-Stars flinched. The first game to get scared out of the $70 price. And with Godfall also coming to PC for $60, this leaves the only $70 console exclusive launch title as Demon Souls, a game from 2009. Cyberpunk 2077, the biggest and most anticipated upcoming game, allegedly upcoming game, is not participating. And neither is this, or this, or this, or this. Also, something that has kind of gotten lost in this video that I should mention is, for the most part, games don't cost $60 either. My favorite games are usually $40 or less. And when you look at this year in particular, 2020 has been the year of the cheap game. Fall Guys, 20. Phasmophobia, 13. Among Us, 5. Helltaker, free. And the list goes on. All these articles talking about how the $70 game is inevitable, I kind of feel like even the $60 game is threatened. I mean, think about it. With so many hugely popular games priced well under $60, filling people's backlogs and monopolizing Twitch, it's actually never been easier for people to wait for full price games to get cheaper. I'm waiting on Crash 4 to go on sale right now. And it seems like you don't have to wait long. So, are we looking at a future of $70 games? I don't know. I feel like it's gonna be a really hard sell when every other video game is like Every 12 days we lower the price until it sells $9.98 Come get it $44? Yes! $37? Okay, $48 Let's go! $23 Wrap it up $13 Smoking $35 Okie dokie, what's the difference? $62 bucks. Been sitting here for 5 years just come get it. 747, just like the airplane. Take off! 38, let's roll. 39, rock and roll. Better wait 12 days on that one.